Um, thank you all for joining me today to talk about what can open source project health metrics reveal about project users. Um, my name is Sophia Vargas, and as you can see, I am missing a Georg link. Um, this session was designed to be two presenters. Uh, Georg contributed to the research that we'll be talking about in this session, but unfortunately he couldn't be here today. So I said two people are more resilient than one, so we can still do the presentation. Um, and please pester Georg with questions afterward because he was very instrumental to this work. So um, thanks again for joining after lunch. I know that can be a little slow, day two of a conference. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Sophia Vargas. I am an active member and on the governing board of the Chaos Project. Um, and I'm also an analyst and researcher inside of Google's open source programs office. This means I work on a lot of research and analytical tasks in support of open source work, both contrib contribution inside of Google as well as outside of Google, um, supporting broader community members through the Chaos community and other spaces. Um, Georg, who couldn't be here today but put the slide together because he's awesome, um, is a co-founder and current board member of the Chaos Community and Chaos Project as well, um, and is also an open source strategist at the Tergia. Um, Georg and I have been working together in the Chaos Community for the last four years, um, where we've been talking a lot about open source project health metrics and their various <coughs> applications and understanding contribution in and around our and general open source projects. So if you, anyone in the room familiar with the Chaos Project? Yes, okay, great. Um, for the rest of you who didn't raise your hand and those on the live stream, Chaos stands for Community Health Analytics of Open Source Software. This is a kind of a, a non-traditional looking open source project. It's made up of researchers and practitioners who are all interested in better understanding project health through the measurement and collection and analytics um, anal analysis of metrics. Um, and so we define metrics. We talk about how metrics should be defined. We talk about how metrics should be implemented. We also work on software like Augur and Grimora Labs, which are tools designed to both consume the data and produce the metrics that we have defined within the chaos community. We're also working on other ways to help practitioners understand how to implement metrics for things like practitioner guides and active working groups and um, specific practitioner working groups like the OSP working group where we meet regularly to talk about problems we're having inside of our companies and how we're trying to measure them and proactively work toward resolving them through data. You can learn more about our project um, on chaos.community or on our GitHub page. So, why are we here today? This question was posed, I believe, at ChaosCon 2021, when I was curious to know how other people were thinking about understanding users. Wouldn't it be great to know how many people use our project? A lot of projects would love to know this. For example, in the Chaos Project, how do we know what things we should keep maintaining? How do we know what plugins we should keep maintaining? What about random versions that we forgot about? Are the people still using those? Wouldn't it be nice to know? We're maintainers. We don't have a lot of time. What, how, we want to know, make sure that we're focusing our time on the right things. Um, inside of organizations, or maybe people are looking at how to think about how much value their project can bring to a community or to an ecosystem. We can't really answer any of these questions without knowing how many people use our project or even how they use our project. So we we're thinking we can't really collect this data directly, but can we learn a little bit about a user community from data that we already have? Granted, if people want to really understand their users, the best way to do it probably is to inject some sort of call home feature. Now, if your product didn't launch with this, I'm going to guess it's not going to be well received if you add it later, <laughs> because people generally don't want you to collect more information about them, um, especially with rising privacy concerns now that more people are thinking about how people are using their data and what they're doing with their data. Um, generally, people don't want you to collect more information without asking for permission first. So if you are thinking about adding telemetry to a project around anything to do with your users, it's best to do it completely transparently and in conversation with your user community so you don't alienate the same people you're trying to support. Um, I think a project that does this in a really interesting way is the Debian project, which created the PopCon tool. This is a tool that any user can use to generate usage information about the things that they have already installed and the files that they're accessing um, throughout the Debian project. Um, they can pull a re weekly report and this allows them to better understand their usage characteristics across the Debian project. Then they have the choice to share that data back with the Debian community. 
Um, this is not a default share. This is a choice, um, an opt-in method. And when they hit the button, it anonymizes all of their identifiers. So Debian isn't actually collecting anything about who the person is or what company that is, but this does give them some valuable information of what packages or verges are still being in use on a, on a regular basis. So we directly know that this can impact maintainers by telling them what they should keep supporting. But we've also seen a, another benefit from this information, which is research. We can better understand community dynamics between things that are being created, things that are being maintained, and things that are being used. Because a lot of the times, if we don't understand our usage and how things are being put into practice, it's harder to understand what's going on in the community. There's just so many more questions you can answer if you can also better understand the usage characteristics. Another example of a project that's been collecting information about usage characteristics is the OpenStack and Open Infra Foundation, which has been running an annual survey. I don't know how long this has been going on, but I remember seeing it getting sent out in 2014, so I know it's been going on for a really long time. Um, if Eldeco is in the room, I'd ask her how many years they've run this, but I know it's been a lot. Um, and yes, it's a survey, so it's opt-in by nature, and so you're not collecting information from every individual user about any, every individual case, but you are getting a lot of interesting information, because in the Open Infra project and foundation, there are a lot of sub-projects, as you can see from this graph. Um, and so this gives you a sense of which ones are more popular than others, and because they've been running the survey every year, they can see this information over time. So then again, it's not perfect and exact usage count, but it does give you some feedback around and from your users as well as saying looking at how many clouds are based on OpenStack and things like that. Downloads are probably the most popular metric used to understand usage um, because a lot of it, it can be freely available from package managers like PyPy and NPM. Um, if, if anyone has used download data, you know that it might be kind of flaky and kind of noisy like whatever is happening next to me right now. Um, I mean, one of the frequent examples that I love to use, I was, I was working with the project and it took in the time to generate a graph of all of the download data it had over time. And the person was bemused enough that they called me and put the slide up and it was a sine wave, as in the graph went like this. And clearly that was not based on actual user behavior and most likely some sort of automation or CI CD system. So clearly download data is flawed. <laughs> It is noisy, it represents individual downloads, which could be one person who's re-imaged their machine 10 times, or one person installing one package across thousands of machines, and we can't really see that granularity in just information from this. So interesting, but noisy, and maybe not as helpful. So that brings us to the general question of, what about other sources of information? We, within the chaos community, look at a lot of different kinds of metrics about open source projects, open source contributors, people that interact with open source projects, all in the name of looking at what's happening in and around that project and community. But we know intrinsically that not everyone who interacts with our project is a contributor. They might be an interested party. They might even be a user, in which case we suspect that user and usage data is also being captured in the same metrics that we use to evaluate project health. So in addition to the things like downloads, we also might have users submitting issues on your GitHub page or other issue trackers. We might see users signing up for mailing lists to understand what's coming in your roadmap of your project, um, or even submitting questions on forums and Stack Overflow asking about how other people are using things and trying to get more detailed information from other users and contributors in the community. Social media has also been a prominent source of information, how many people are following your project, how many people are talking about your project, also very noisy if anyone's looked at that data. Um, and another really popular one is looking at web analytics. How many people are visiting your website? How many people are visiting your documentation? How many people are repeatedly visiting your documentation? Because that's a pretty good indicator that they're trying to use your thing. And then of course, how many people show up at events? Um, and how many people are present in the spaces that are easily countable? Um, Garrick and I have been talking about this for, again, since 2021, um, and we originally wrote a blog post um, published on opensource.com, I have it linked here, with eight ideas to measure project usage through these sort of proxy metrics. And we talk about the pros and cons, we also list a number of very specific metrics, if you're curious about that. And that was sort of a, the initial exploration into this concept. The more we were thinking about it, we were wondering, well, okay, so we know downloads are pretty good but noisy. We know that documentation views, if we get unique views over time, 
that might be pretty good. But are beyond that, are some metrics better than others in terms of indicating usage? And this we didn't really know because there's no way to verify that unless you can compare it with data that you know is true and truly representing the number of users you have in a project. Um, so to answer that, we attempted and we were able to execute a case study for doing precisely that. Um, and I was very lucky to have the cooperation of the Flutter project, which is a project under Google that builds a UI framework for app development across a variety of platforms. And the Flutter project is an open source project, and they're also very supportive of open source project research and things that can better support the community. So with their cooperation, they gave us some of their user data. Uh, specifically, they supplied their monthly active user counts, which was defined as the number of active users in the last 30 days. And we took that metric as it was recorded on the last day of each month as a proxy for how many users they had per month um, in the time frame of January 1st, 2018 to February 18th, 2021. The full case study we were able to publish earlier this year at the Mining Software Repositories Conference um, in Lisbon, and you have the DOI link there below. People are taking pictures, so I'll leave it there for a second longer. Um, I'm basically going to spoil all the findings in that research paper, so you're welcome to read it again, but I'm going to tell you all the highlights right now. Um, and so for the premise of the project, we wanted to take a bunch of proxy metrics and compare them directly to this monthly active user count. Um, notice that this is a subset of the list that we had before. Um, this is due to a few reasons. One, you might notice there's no download data here and there's no website data here. This is because Google owns the package manager and the website and website analytics data around the Flutter project. Thus, it was behind more red tape and would have been harder to externalize. And as part of the research project, we wanted to make sure that our entire data set could be published externally so that other people could view the data as well as repeat the analysis that we did. Um, so we opted to not include it for this round. I think if we had a lot more time and a, a lot uh, more patience with some of the processes that take to release private data, um, I would like to include it potentially in a future iteration. Um, but for now, we were relying on publicly available data sources that hopefully any other project could also use, like GitHub data, looking at pull requests, issues, issue authors, stars and forks, um, activity on Stack Overflow around how many people were asking questions in a given month, um, questions in month, as well as looking at Slack data, people that have subscribed to the Slack channel, um, and number of messages over time. Um, note specifically that we chose to exclude known Google employees from the pull request metric um, because Google does um, manage the code base itself and controls whose code gets into the code base. And we didn't feel like that was a metric that was going to behave as intended in our, in our particular use case. Um, so we thought we would get more organic behavior by removing Googlers from that count specifically. Also note that I put all of these metrics into some sort of per month so that we could compare it directly to our monthly active user counts. To collect the data, we used Grimoire Labs, which you mentioned earlier, or I don't know if I mentioned earlier, is a chaos project. That's one of the software projects that we work on uh, to collect data from GitHub and Stack Overflow. Um, Grimoire Labs also has this amazing tool called Sorting Hat, which automatically looks through all the domains and people's commit addresses and assigns them to an affiliation. So if you commit under your at Google email, it'll label you as a Google employee. So we were able to use the native tool here to filter out Google employees and it could be replicated by other affiliations as necessary. Um, we also used the GitHub archive project to get historical counts of stars and forks. And we were able to pull Slack data directly from the Slack channel itself. The result was this data set. Um, you can see we also published the data set on Sonoda.com, so you can see the entire table if you would like to. And the first thing we noticed is there seems to be a strong linear relationship between all of these values. Um, from the top line, which is Flutter monthly active users, to all the other proxy metrics that we pulled and assembled um, into this data set. Um, we explicitly proved that by calculating the R-squared value for monthly active users compared with all of these proxy metrics. Um, and with the exception of fork events, the rest of them were above 0.71, which if you're less familiar with statistics, this is pretty good. Um, it's a pretty strong indicator, definitely anything over 0.5. Um, and so we could say, okay, these things definitively seem to have a linear relationship. Um, so that gives us 
pretty much leeway to use tests like the Spearman and Pearson correlation tests, which if you're familiar with statistics, I'm not really going to go into that, but uh, they're very popular correlation tests to use against uh, normally distributed linear data sets. Um, notice that I said normal, um, the data set isn't technically fully normal, it's normal-ish, I like to say, um, because it's not a random sample. Um, clearly, this was a very specific thing. We created a project, we launched it, um, and other activity is going to be somewhat related to the project. Um, so that's why we also use Spearman correlations in addition to just Pearson. Um, here I have the full test examples, um, full test results rather, and you can see every single test is greater than 80 with the exception of that one fork event. This is also very strong. In fact, anything over 70 is considered a very strong correlation, a very strong positive correlation. And this kind of intuitively makes sense, right? We had, you can see from the original chart that monthly active users was steadily growing month over month. And so it makes sense that all of these other proxy indicators would also grow steadily month over month. So cool, but like not particularly groundbreaking. Um, stars and forks do come toward the top, but again, everything's pretty strong. When we ran the same tests looking at month over month growth rates and then compared those with the same correlation test, here we see a lot more variance. We didn't see as much, well, pretty much any relationship with uh, Slack messages or members, um, potentially less with pull request issues and less with issues, but stars and forks, once again, coming toward the top. Um, this was somewhat surprising for us uh, because we, when I say we, me personally, I've been discounting stars for a while as a viable metric. I always kind of viewed it as a popularity metric, right? You're like, oh, that looks kind of cool. I'll put a star. People ask you to star their project. And so like, okay, it could give you a sense of popularity, but is it is actually indicating usage? This kind of indicates that it might be. So maybe I shouldn't be discounting stars. Um, and in fact, should also be considering forks. We took this one step further. Because the data itself, if you remember the original chart, showed a very strong linear relationship between all of these metrics, we thought, could we, say, using algebra that we learned in like middle school, create a simpler, simple linear forecast model by generating the slope value of the relationship between each of these individual proxy metrics? So we did that, and then we compared the slope to the per average ratios between these values, and then looked at the standard deviation between the two. And the results indicate, once again, that cumulative four counts seem to have the most consistent relationship and predictive relationship uh, to monthly active users. Th this meant that at any given month, if I plugged in that cumulative four count into the slope generated by this, by this um, equation, then I would get to, well, I mean, granted there was a, an error bar, but a pretty good sense of how many current active users were using Flutter at the time. So, are forks a good proxy for usage? <laughs> you see, this is a question mark, and I have a picture of my slightly bemused cat who I don't think has a lot of brain cells at the moment. Maybe none at all, if you're familiar with the orange cat brain cell theory. Um, but if you have ever worked on a research project, we usually end up with more questions. And here, again, we have more questions. This is one case study over one time period using a subset of the metrics that we think could be viable indicators of usage. But I think we got some pretty interesting results. Um, one thing to note, we did reach out to the Flutter project and we asked, so do you have any sort of documentation or guidance that would yield this kind of behavior about forks, like in terms of either how you're guiding people to use or contribute to your project? And they said no. So this seems to be organic behavior. Um, again, question mark, are forks a good proxy for usage? Maybe I should add stars to that too. Um, that's actually it. So Garrick and I were going to do this together, and we had a whole conversation planned, and now it's just me. Um, but we really wanted to open it up for questions. and. I'm also really curious to hear from the room if other people have attempted to measure usage using other approximations um, and whether or not you've had any success with that. Um, I'm also clearly I'm here to answer any questions. I can go back to any of the research that we discussed. Um, and we can also end early if no one wants to talk about anything. So thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, so I'm, I'm Nitish Tiari from Gartner, uh, and last year we published a toolkit about uh, how to assess open source projects. And uh, it's, it's an Excel-based toolkit, but some of the metrics that we use, so 
of course, we wanted to make it as simple as it could be so that, you know, maximum uh, of our clients can use it. But one other metric than the foods and stars we use were watchers, which definitely turns out to be pretty important as well, that how many users are actively watching a particular project. Uh, secondly, I have a question uh, uh, about for, for chaos. Uh, by the way, I'm a fan of your work. Chaos community is doing really great work here. Uh, but the challenges are getting more complex with Etsy library coming into picture. So any new metrics that Chaos community is thinking of introducing to, to, to you know, verify the maintainers or validate the maintainers? To verify maintainers? Yeah. Not in chaos specifically. Um, I'm looking at Dawn is here. No, she's also nodding her head. This, we haven't quite discussed this as much. I think in chaos, we've been looking more at aggregate statistics of community behavior and using that as an indicator of how things are going. Um, I think I was thinking about the session the panel earlier that I heard on supply chain security track of folks were there in the room where we were, they were talking about the inherent conflict of collecting more information about individuals and wanting to ensure the anonymity of any one individual and then instead relying on metrics that can reveal process gaps versus potential suspicious actors. Um, and so I think within chaos, we do have a number of metrics that can look more at the procedural health or operational health of a project um, versus looking at the behavior of any one individual. But in theory, you can. I mean, a lot of the data is out there, even if you don't know who the identity is. Um, but we haven't been looking at that specifically. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, two things. Uh, the, yeah, the stars, I mean, I, it's kind of a running joke that the number of stars are to remain to um, are indicative of performance health so or open source project health so I, I, I assume you know based on what you said it's you're that's not really taken into consideration that much I didn't quite understand the math behind that but the um, the other thing is you know we I didn't do this but somebody on my team um, was running to help I mean he was he did the um, the nature of the pull request for specific um, pro specific projects okay. for example the security issues they were having, he ranked those. Uh, is that something that kind of, uh, or as a vertical data or sub data sets, is that in the works for chaos or is that a discussion? It, it was a discussion. And I say was because I'm gonna call out another individual who I don't see in the room. So I'll just have to reference her by name, Kate Stewart uh, and, and I and Sean um, Goggins for a while attempted to get more into the granular detail of issues and pull requests by reviewing tags. Um, and the challenge that we had is that no project consistently uses tags, um, especially even for things like bugs and especially security issues, those are often obscured uh, intentionally. And so when we were trying to sort issues and pull requests and activity specifically around more contextual information in the project, yeah. we couldn't really do it on aggregate. We could do it for individual projects. There are some projects that have really robust tagging systems and strategies. In that case, then you could say, look at the activity generated around things that you know might be more akin to user issues versus like central maintenance problems that are probably being worked on by contributors or even certain classes of contributors. Um, and so we've done that, or I've done that personally for individual projects, but not aggregately because of that challenge. So per project, that's, that's pretty feasible. It can be, yeah. Okay, cool. If the project has a robust tagging strategy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, and just come back to the, the stars piece. Um, and more, I guess, the, the math indicated that there was a strong correlation that doesn't actually, again, a correlation is not causation. So just it, take that with a grain of salt. There just seemed to be a strong relationship between the two values. Yep. And also, I don't really look at stars for health. This isn't necessarily looking at health. It's looking at usage. Middle school algebra. <laughs> Hey, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think that in my work with open source, I encountered a few aspects of the community. So you have first the community consumers, and it's impossible to track who's using your code because there is no metric. 
Then you have the ones that will want to contribute back. And you get a fork. And if you count the number of forks, you can guess how many companies or individuals are working with your project. And it gives you an indication of the health metrics. Regarding the stars, it's fairly common at different events for people to ask for a star. So it's not an indication. Agree, yeah. yeah. Again, that's why I was surprised. <laughs> so one idea would be to ask people to fill a form from time to time if they want to give you some feedback. Uh, the other metric that I found quite useful is the time since um, an issue is open until an issue is closed. How many issues are open? How many issues are closed? Those usually give you an indication if the project is alive and if somebody is taking care of it. Thank you for that. Actually, quick thing, because I did a talk on some of this stuff uh, not too long ago, but I pulled up some stats regarding the labels and making it easier to like look at things. Uh, out of a random sampling of GitHub projects, 50% uh, actually labeled issues consistently, only 17% labeled PRs, and only 58% used milestones. So that you know just goes to show how hard it can actually be to, to track this stuff in a more widespread manner. Thank you for the data, Bob. Hey, great talk. Uh, so I pulled up, I took a picture of the graph earlier. I had a question about, so you could see the number of forks actually increasing. That is very interesting. I was wondering why, in at least in the graph, the, 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 it doesn't seem to lead to more pull requests being open, though. Like in the graph, it doesn't show the pull request line doesn't show basically as far as I can see. So is there, is it good that a project has more forks, but not as many pull requests? This could have been flawed by my methodology because I removed Googlers from the pull requests, but not from the fork. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Yeah, um, and that was again because of the pull request process being tied to the submission of a c commit, whereas anyone can fork and do anything. So I think possibly I should have just excluded that metric because I, I thought it would be too flawed in, in its nature. Um, so the other reason why you can't see it is because the numbers are very small. So I would have had to use a logarithmic scale in order for that to come up in it. But I wanted to showcase the linear relationship, which is why we stuck with a regular graph. Thank you for the question and for pointing out flaws in my methodology. I <laughs> know <laughs> it's good. This is research to be challenged. If I don't learn anything, I've, I'm flawed. So I saw another question in the back. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Um, I uh, missed the start of your talk, so I apologize if you mentioned this. But uh, one thing I'm particularly interested in is trying to identify communities that have a risk of the bait and switch or rug pull type license issues and uh, move into proprietary licenses. Uh, have you done any investigation into that or did anything come up in your investigations or just what's your general opinion on it? Um, we've actually been looking at this in a sub working group in the chaos project. Um, Don Foster recently kicked off the data science working group. Um, and there's a couple of us that have been thinking about this question to see if we could see some of that in the data ahead of time. Um, I know a lot of the initial progression has been looking at activity and affiliation with an activity. So with the hypothesis that if a project is dominated by one vendor, then it's more likely to face some of those, um, that, that possible risk. Um, but one of the biggest problems we've had with pursuing that line of research um, is that we don't have enough information about the companies themselves. So I think it's looking at only open source activity and thinking about this as a business decision. We don't have data, data about the business itself unless it's a completely publicly traded company. And a lot of times they're not. So it's, it's going to be a difficult line. I think that I'm trying to remember if that has been paused or if it's currently being pursued, but it's definitely been discussed. Um, I have not personally worked on it. I just have been consulted on, on the methodology and looking into it. So it's definitely something that's being discussed. Um, and maybe next year we'll have more to say about that. Thank you. It 
Don, I'm going to ask you to repeat that comment. All right. The, the comment was, was that a relicensing is such an incredibly rare event when you think about the sheer number of open source projects and the number that have been relicensed, which is a couple handfuls. So it's, it's just really hard to analyze because it's, it's just not enough data. Yep, and I actually, I do have data to back up that comment too. Um, earlier this year at MSR, there was a paper published on uh, just general trends of licensing across five or six different package management ecosystems. So looking at thousands of packages and repositories in those places, and they only found license changes in under 10%. I wanna say it was 8%-ish, and it was different depending on the package ecosystem. So when you're looking at tens of thousands of packages, that's a number, but not a huge number. Um, and honestly, most of those license changes were really minor. Um, and sometimes it was because possibly an oversight, <laughs> uh, like it wasn't dramatic license changes. They were going from MIT to Apache 2 or something like that, or they didn't have a license at all and they added one. <laughs> um, so if you look into the details of it, it actually isn't as common. Um, and so like to, to Don's point, there's is actually, there's not a lot of available data. Um, we have a couple prominent examples, but that's usually not enough to build a model at this stage. Thank you. Uh, are you going to look into um, a more qualitative analysis on impacts, on impact an organization can have on like open source ecosystems and projects? Like I don't know, Google willing to quantify um, how much they are yes investing. And yes. <laughs> um, I, I've done a whole number of projects related to this question. I think. Generally, the question changes by project. Um, there's sort of the general question of how healthy are the projects in our ecosystem or portfolio, the inverse question being how healthy are the projects that we consume uh, inside our infrastructure and services. Um, and it, particularly for a company like Google, this is a very large number of projects on both sides of that. So there have been attempts to look at things more aggregately, but I think I've been more involved in projects that have looked more specifically at individual projects. And the ones that have gone, that's why I say the ones, the efforts that have gone better are ones that have concrete goals in the end. If you are looking at, say, improving community engagement and then looking at metrics that will track community engagement and say participants and new participants coming in and retention of their participants, then you have a direct baseline and results to analyze as you change your behavior. Um, I've worked with a number of projects that have just sort of collected data because they were curious, but that often doesn't lead to a lot of action if they don't really know what they want to do with that information. Um, so it's sort of in, in metrics and efforts in general, um, the ones that have worked better again have had very concrete goals and measurements against those goals. Um, and that's a very generic way to answer your question because we've, we've done this exercise with many different flavors in the past. So if you have one specific one you want to talk about, then we can focus it on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, quick ones. Uh, the first one is, have you, I mean, have you verified the validity of your metrics uh, on another, for example, open source project? Not yet. We're still trying to find when that collects data. <laughs> um, and even a project like Flutter, I, I didn't mention this before. So they had an, an opt out method and also collected data around how many people opted out. So their numbers were pretty good. Um, and then they recently changed their telemetry process and policy. Um, and now they have less accurate data around their user accounts because they moved to an opt in model, um, which is more popular at this point with other projects. Um, and we've just, we've had a challenge to get other projects that are collecting data to share their data with us. So if you have a project and you're collecting open source usage data, I would love to look at it. Um, but yeah, it's, that's been a challenge. Um, and we're actively hopeful because of the partnership and adoption of the SCARF project. If folks are familiar with SCARF, it is um, a usage analysis tool that was developed by other open source enthusiasts. Um, and is being added actively to some Linux Foundation projects. It's still early stages, so we don't have a lot of data and that data isn't actively being shared broadly, but we're hopeful that maybe we can have a little bit more to work with and that will be focused more on downloads, but they do collect more en enriched metadata around it and potentially we could learn from that as well. All right, thanks. And the second question is, I mean, personally, myself, I work in functional safety uh, in Red Hat. So and right now, 
uh, especially now. Uh, uh, the current trend is to lo also look at software reliability uh, to evaluate, you know, what is, you know, to, to, as a possible, you know, uh, evidence to, to, to make a safety claim on, on a piece of software. So my question is, do you also intend to, I don't know, to extend the research to uh, create a, a reliability model uh, by looking at the, you know, defect rate versus usage? I haven't looked at that, but other researchers have. Um, we've looked at using health metrics to look at possible risk in projects or possibility for um, either being abandoned or having vulnerabilities crop up. And actually one of, one of my favorite pieces of applied research came out of Sonotype when they looked at all the metrics and scorecard and use it as a seed use it against their repository of information to see which projects actually had vulnerabilities as a way to test which metrics were better indicators of possible vulnerability or security issues down the road. So I was a big fan of that one. I think that was their 2003 report. Um, but in terms of doing this myself and looking at sort of the usage versus um, impact on the project, um, there is a researcher, Kayla Champion, who just completed her PhD actually from North, no, she's Washington State. I'm sorry, sorry, Washington University. She knows this is on recording, and so I hope she doesn't listen to this. Um, and she was looking specifically at the Debian project between production and demand. And so looking at supply demand as an indicator of risk um, of under production. Um, and so for her, the, the research did capture a number of projects that were being used more than they were maintained. Um, and so she's sort of uh, that research was looking at whether or not surfacing that information could do anything about that project. And it's uh, sometimes it, it doesn't. I mean, if it's one maintainer and they find out a lot of people are using the project, they'll probably just keep doing the work, but maybe they might not do more work. Um, and so this is an open question in terms of how people would react to that. And there have been a number of researchers that are looking at the impact of providing proactive metrics to the maintainers directly to see how well that kind of information could change their behavior in the moment. Um, but I'm, I'm less familiar with how the results are playing out. I just know it's actively being researched. Thank you. Uh, hey, so I, um, I enjoyed the talk, and I'm not sure if this is a, a, a silly question or not. I'm fairly new to this space. Um, has, has there been any thought to, um, to actually going to, like, uh, going to like the app stores or the other software distribution systems and like doing a software component analysis on, on the deployed binaries to try to look at the binary, see, like, see what libraries have, have, have actually been used, and then attributing use based on the number of users of that app within the like app store and sort of hanging something on like the metrics that the app store is already um, uh, is already collecting for those applications. I guess the question back is, is the app store going to share their data with me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great question. I just know like when I go to the store, it tells me approximately how many downloads there are. I don't know if that's sufficiently accurate. Yeah, sometimes you can get some information from that. I've had a harder time getting historical information because I think a lot of this is we want to see trends over time. And so if um, I've, some projects have meticulously logged that because they can't pull the data, um, in which case they had to create their own data set essentially by creating a record. Um, but in theory, that could be a line of, of pursuit. Um, there have been other usage estimates that are based on sort of the extended ecosystem dependency trees, which again, you don't actually know how many things are in production or running, but you could see how many references there are. Um, and then there is uh, the census report, the LF sponsored with uh, Harvard researchers that looked at usage inside of organizations, but that is not public data because they were sharing proprietary data around their internal usage specific software packages. And so they made their usage <coughs> estimates based on a model again of the ecosystem adoption and dependency trees alongside internal corporate information. But again, unfortunately that data set is not available um, outside of that project. I think we might be one more minute, one more question. Uh, sure. Um, uh, great presentation. I wondered if you uh, could comment maybe on perhaps the viability of uh, causal studies moving beyond, say, correlational studies, but rather saying like, okay, we have an independent variable, be it funding, be it, you know, documentation, whatever, and how that then affects dependent variables of, say, usage. 
um, and to what extent you can kind of sketch aggregated causal narratives uh, and if that's viable in your view. It's hard. Um, I've seen a couple of studies that have done this pretty well, but they've been very narrow in focus um, because you have to look at one particular attribute. Um, but a lo most of them were correlation, not causation. And the way they get into it is often by having to go in and talk to the people. Um, I think there, there are other statistical methods that get more robust to model these things, but it's generally really hard <laughs> um, because it's often because a lot of this is totally anonymous. There's no way to really understand unless you have more information or unless you're able to collect more information about those individuals. Um, so I've relied more on surveys for that, um, which is, again, it's, that's not going to give you quantitative metrics, but it give you more qualitative metrics on why and how and which things might have been more influential along your journey or exacting certain kinds of behavior. Um, so that's typically what I would recommend is some sort of combination of all the above. Um, I, I saw a really awesome study recently that was looking at the impact of adding specific types of documentation on con contributors in, in a project. So when they added, say, the readme file, how many more people started contributing to the project afterward? And again, you're looking at this in a timeline, so it's very much still a correlation. But it seems like a pretty good indicator of causation. And if you're actually able to talk to those individuals, then you would know for sure and be able to verify that. Um, if there are other researchers in the house that want to comment on looking at causation, I'd love to know. No? Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for being very engaged. I appreciate it.